Hey, Emily, you're good to go. Hello, awesome. Um, does my video feed and audio all sound okay? Yep, sounds good. Great, so I'll, I'll just launch into the, the talk about myself. I'll, I'll take that as a yes to prevent too much awkward silence, but feel free to butt in if I'm following the schedule wrong or anything. Um, but good morning, everyone. Thank you for your attention and your time. Um, my name is Emily Mendoza. I'm one of the engineers here at Edwards Air Force Base. And I'm just here to talk about myself and my path to working here at Edwards for 20 minutes. And then I'll leave some time for questions about me at the end. Um, to begin, I am from Southern California originally, down in Orange County specifically. Um, I studied at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, before coming to work here at Edwards. Um, I was a physics major, actually, not technically an engineer, but I learned a lot of engineering things studying physics. And while I was studying physics, I actually also got a minor in Russian while studying the Russian language for three years there which was just something kind of cool to do on the side. Yes, we can only put yes, Gavri Navruskum, Ani Panimayu Teta. Just, I like to show off a little bit sometimes. Thanks to everyone for humoring me. While I was studying at UCLA, I also did research in plasma physics, um, which for anyone not familiar with plasma, it's a uh, another state of matter basically when you get gases hot enough. Um, and I worked at this big chamber uh, underneath my school um, that basically took gases and then like heated them up and then we would do different science experiments in that big facility down there. And that is kind of how I got interested in what I do now. Um, the specific work that I did while I was in college was a lot of programming and data analysis on everything that we collected while working in our lab there. And we were specifically looking at different types of waves in plasmas. And I don't know if how familiar people are with waves in the physics -y sense, but just like you'll see waves at the ocean when you go to the beach, um, light, also travels in waves, sound travels in waves. And when you are looking at different substances, you'll get different weird kinds of waves that happen within them. Um, and you get electric and magnetic waves that happen in plasmas. So I learned a lot about electric and magnetic waves while I was researching plasma. And it turns out when you want to work for the Air Force, and work on planes and do cool things like that. They care a lot about electric and magnetic waves because we do a lot of testing on things like radar systems um, on our planes here at Edwards. Um, if you haven't heard of radar, it's uh, sh basically shooting light waves out of your plane, bouncing it back off of something, and then seeing what it bounced off of in order to determine what's out there. And a lot of the physics that I learned in college translated into that. So. While I was in college, I was looking for work because I wanted to eat and have a place to live after I graduated. So I heard about some people from Edwards Air Force Base um, coming out to my school for the electrical engineering department to do a talk about the work they did here at Edwards. And they talked about how radar worked, what their daily lives were like, what their jobs were like. And I thought it was really interesting and I was looking for work. So I left my information with them. They reached out to me and I started working here right after I graduated from college. And I've been here for just over three years now. Um, it's been really cool working out here for the Air Force and uh, living here in the Antelope Valley. 
Um, I actually, because I grew up in Southern California, I have family out here, uh, which meant I kind of knew the area already. <clears throat> so it's been, it's been fun coming out here, especially after kind of escaping the big city of Los Angeles. At Edwards Air Force Base, um, I am specifically an RF engineer, where RF stands for radio frequency, because um, I work with radio waves. Um, I'm sort of an antenna engineer. I do physics things for antennas, um, like the kind of antenna that you might see sticking up out of a car, or like a satellite dish you might see on the roof of a house uh, that receives signals that gets you TV stations, unless you have cable or something, but you've probably still seen those around on rooftops. Um, I work at the Benefield Anechoic Facility at Edwards Air Force Base, which is a big anechoic chamber. In fact, it is the biggest anechoic chamber as far as we know, unless the Russians or the Chinese are hiding a really big one that we haven't found out about yet. And an anechoic chamber is basically a big metal box and it's a big metal box with the walls treated in a special way to not let radio waves bounce around inside of it. So we are this big old shielded metal box inside one of the hangars at the end of a runway on the base. Um, and we are um, specifically 70 feet high by 260 feet wide. Uh, is it 260 or we're, we're big enough to hold basically any aircraft that the United States Air Force has. So we've had like the, the B-2 bomber in there. We've had the B-52 in there. I have specifically worked a whole bunch on the B-1 bomber that has been in our chamber a couple times since I began three years ago. So very, very big chamber. Imagine a room bigger than anything you've ever been inside before. I pretty much guarantee you. And the reason that we are a big metal box is that radio waves can't get into or out of um, metal or anything conductive like metal. So we can do all sorts of electromagnetic testing inside of our facility. And no matter what you have going on in there, no one's going to be able to tell from monitoring outside of our building what's happening inside. So we can do all sorts of secret things without a satellite overhead picking up whatever's going on. The other cool thing about an anechoic chamber is that the floor, the walls, and the ceiling are all lined with radiation absorbing material, or RAM, um, which is basically just couch foam arranged in a clever way. It looks like a whole bunch of pyramids just endlessly along every surface of our chamber. And that actually absorbs radio waves instead of letting them bounce off of the walls. And what that means is we can bring an aircraft into our building and we can have it sitting on the floor or we can hang it from the ceiling. And if we're shooting radio signals at it or having it shoot radio signals at us, um, because there won't be any interference from the outside and because those signals won't go bouncing around inside of our closed room, it is essentially the same as if we were measuring what that aircraft was doing while it was flying in the air which is what we want to do because that's actually that I work in. Um, and I'm specifically an RF engineer and antenna engineer there. So I design and set up and run and analyze the data from the tests on aircraft that come in, which has been really cool. I can't talk too much about the projects that I'm working on right now because we have to be a little bit secretive about things that are coming up, but we have we do have more tests that are coming in that I'm trying to get prepared for. Um, but some things that I've worked on before, I've actually worked on the B-1 bomber twice since I started here three years ago. And what we did with it was we brought it in here, uh, we hooked up to its antennas, and then we tried to figure out how good of coverage um, its antennas provided against systems that it might be flying around. So bring a bomber in here, connect to it, transmit signals through it, and we can also set up a whole bunch of equipment around it to basically transmit radio waves um, at whatever radio waves you want at it to make sure that it functions as expected. Um, I have 
I have also worked on designing a similar test for the AC-130. Um, I've also worked on some projects for smaller systems, like something that will happen other than bringing whole aircraft in is that we'll have companies or organizations want to just bring a smaller, like new kind of antenna system they've designed into our chamber to test it rather than um, rather than trying to test everything at once. And then we can really go into the meat of how like some specific system works. And those often get really cool because sometimes it can be a lot of theory and a lot of math to figure out how that smaller thing is going to work rather than just knowing how some overall bomber works. Um, I'm supposed to talk about what the best part about my job is. And I think the best part about my job for me is that we are encouraged a lot to innovate and to come up with new ideas and new um, fancier ways to test things. So sometimes I'll have entire weeks for what I'm doing in the office is I'll just be looking at um, like new physics papers that people have published online and reading through them and taking notes and thinking, okay, this is something that some scientists just came up with. We can apply this to test things better and faster and more efficiently in our chamber. And then I can recommend that to someone or come up with a test design based on that. Or <clears throat> I can program solutions based on that to, to improve all of our processes. It's not just go in, you're this kind of engineer, set up this equipment today, things like that. There's every day is different. Every day has the opportunity for new challenges, um, which is something that is really cool and gratifying about my job and about working at, at Edwards in general. Um, I'm supposed to give one key point of advice to any student who wants to pursue a career in STEM. So any kind of science, tech, engineering, math, and I was physics specifically. And I think that for me, my biggest point of advice would be to have some hobbies and interests outside of STEM. Have something outside of engineering or school that you're passionate about. Um, because unfortunately, no matter what you do, um, but also especially when you're getting into engineering and working with people who are way smarter than I am, it can be hard to feel like you're smart enough to get things done all the time. And this is a reason that I liked studying Russian in college so much. It was really nice to get a break from physics classes and go do something where I didn't have to know math to study it um, and where I could interact with a different group of people, have a break from my usual classmates. And these days, um, I, I know that since everyone has been locked down due to the ongoing pandemic, it's harder to have interesting hobbies. But I've been learning to draw a whole lot during the past six, seven months, which is a weird thing to hear uh, from this person on an engineering panel. But it's been a nice way to get a break from um, the, all the challenges of my job and to just learn something new. Um, I like bike riding. I like hiking. I like playing entirely too many video games. Um, I liked a lot of going to hang out with friends before the pandemic hit. Um, I'll be playing Dungeons and Dragons virtually tonight with some other friends. And I think that having things like that and trying to achieve work, life, school, career balance, all of that stuff is very important to make sure that you don't get too tired of whatever the main thing is that you're passionate about. So that's, that's the advice that I would give to anybody. I know that it's only been 20 minutes of the of the overall about myself, um, the job that I've been doing, but I'm seeing a whole bunch of questions pop up. And there are a couple things that are not on my like list of nominated things that I would kind of like to talk about. So um, I think unless Kayla or someone else jumps in here and yells at me, I might start answering people's questions. Um, all right, which order should I go in? Okay, I think I see the order that this is in. All right, how? I don't know if this highlights the question I've selected or everything, but I am responding to Justin Gomez asking, have I worked with a very old plane? I think that personally, the 
B1 might actually be the oldest plane that I've worked with in person because I've worked on a lot of smaller systems rather than just planes every time. But I do know that the B-52 bomber has been into our chamber at least once, um, which of course comes from, which is 50, 60 years old at this point. Um, but the B-52 is really cool because it's something that's so old, but it's, um, it's so robust. It gets its job done. It's still so important in the Air Force today that it's really neat that they're still bringing it in here. Um, to make sure that it can still function if they have to send it out somewhere in the future. So I think that's the the oldest airplane with the Air Force that I've had to interact with in any way. Um, I'm going to call that one done. And then I'm going to go the other direction. Um, what type of engineer am I? I? Like I said, I am an RF engineer or radio frequency engineer. It's kind of a more specific subset of electrical engineer. So if working with radio waves is something you want to do, I recommend going to get a, to get a degree in electrical engineering or in physics. Although I know that at our building, we also hire um, mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, and computer science majors. Did I hear someone okay, say something? Emily. Oh, perfect. Okay. So one of the questions was, what inspired you to be an engineer? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what inspired me to be an engineer? I think that it really came from me being inspired to do physics and math while I was in college. And that started back when I was in high school. It wasn't anything earth shattering or life changing. It was just that when I was going to high school, I kept really liking my math classes. I really liked my physics class when I finally took it. So I decided this is what I'll take a shot at when I go to college. And I just kind of kept enjoying it while I was studying it. And when I was trying to figure out, okay, I like physics, I like math, this is what I've been studying, what can I go do with this? Um, when I started looking into it, um, being an engineer is what you sort of end up doing when this is something that you enjoy. And it's been a really good fit for me over the last few years. Awesome, thank you. Uh, another question is, did you look to, up to anyone going into your job? If yes, who? So this is something kind of cool that I was hoping to talk about. Um, the Nobel Prize in Physics was just announced this morning for the year 2020. And it went to a bunch of people who worked on discovering the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, um, which um, black hole is a really, really dense clump of matter in space that kind of sucks in everything around it because it's so concentrated. So they're, they're called black holes because even light can't get out of them. But one of the people who won was Professor Andrea Ghez, who is a professor of physics at UCLA. Um, who I actually got to meet a couple times while I was studying there. And not only is she really smart, she was also really, really nice. And I got to listen to a whole talk of her explaining the work that she did to prove that there is a really big black hole at the center of the Milky Way um, before she actually won a Nobel Prize for this. And I mean, I, I looked up to her and a lot of other professors and famous engineers and famous scientists, I mean, just because they're really smart and did really cool work. Um, but I think I also remember specifically how well she explained her work and everything that went into her discovery. I don't want to just rant for two hours about how you find black holes, even though I would happily do that if someone let me. But I know that she was able to discover the black hole because she and her team um, were looking specifically at the orbits of stars that were near the center of the galaxy. And it turns out there's a fairly simple equation for how wide an orbit should be when, for example, the Earth is moving around the sun or our sun is moving around the center of the galaxy or something like that. And it depends on how much mass there has to be, like how much stuff there has to be in a specific small space that you're moving in circles around. And because of that equation, she knew that there had to be so much stuff at the center of the galaxy that the only thing that could explain it 
is a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And I thought it was so cool that you can take this small amount of data and use it to deduce and deduce and deduce and infer and figure out this big, um, like life-changing fact about the universe that you know then she won a nobel prize for too and that's something that we get to do as engineers too um we can look at small little bits of data that are coming off the aircraft we're testing and use it to find out okay because of what this data point says we know that this aircraft is not going to perform well when it's in this environment we need to go make this change to fix it and that whole process is just really cool hopefully that didn't go on too much of a tangent but i promise i'm done there Okay, well, along the topic of black holes, one of the questions is, where do you think the objects that enter a black hole go to? Um, gosh, so many good questions. Um, the objects that enter a black hole, I'm really an engineer, more of a physicist these days, so take everything I say um, with a little bit of skepticism, but I do think that objects that enter a black hole just stay inside the black hole. They are just very slowly stretched out as they fall inside um, in a process that is actually called spaghettification because they get stretched out like spaghetti as they're falling in there. And the whole thing that defines a black hole is that it is so dense, so tightly packed full of stuff that even if you were to try to send a beam of light out of it with a flashlight and light is the fastest that anything can ever go, the light still wouldn't be able to escape the gravity of the black hole. So when things go out in there, um, almost nothing comes out. The cool thing about an object falling in there is that the gravity of a black hole um, not only pulls things in, it also distorts time as you fall in. So if you were to fall into a black hole and you somehow survive the process of being stretched out as you were going in, you would see um, basically more and more time in the universe happening all around you and you would never actually experience yourself falling inside even though you actually did and then just to be completely accurate and to ramble entirely too much about physics um, one of the things that Stephen Hawking is famous for is something called Hawking radiation, which is proving that there are actually these tiny particles that do gradually escape black holes. So if you fall into a black hole, you get stuck inside, you see a whole bunch of time at once, and then the little particles from you will slowly trickle out of the black hole um, as the universe gets older and older. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for explaining that. That was, I enjoyed the physics lesson there. Um, <laughs> Thanks. We're going to switch back to, there were a few questions like this, but the main thing was, what did you do to accomplish to get this job? Um, I think that well, the biggest requirement to getting a job like this is to get um, a bachelor's degree, like a four-year degree in, in my case, physics or in electrical engineering um, or mechanical engineering or something like that. So as long as you can do that, you can probably get a job like this. I think that the things I did specifically that stood out um, were that I did research while I was in college. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing when I started looking for labs to work with. I kind of just started talking to graduate students and to professors and said, hey, I want to be involved in physics somehow. Um, I might not know anything, but I'm happy to work hard and learn. And that was how I got a position uh, just doing programming for the plasma physics lab. And I learned so much about not just the physics of plasma, but also how to actually do things out, outside of school, like like to program in a way that was productive for an overall project, um, how to work with people when they had to deal with deadlines and um, with contracts and with getting funding for the research and everything, um, all of that. And then that going into my resume, I think, is what made me valuable as an engineer to get hired here. And just um, something else that I did, too, that I would encourage anybody to do is that I also did some volunteer work while I was in college. I um, worked with a club that would put together uh, like little science demos, um, like li little demonstrations of like just cool science projects you could bring into a classroom. And we would take them to elementary schools that were also in Los Angeles. 
and we would show them off, explain to the kids how they worked, and just get involved with the community in that way. And I think <clears throat> um, showing that you're involved, which is, I mean, something you can do in middle school and in high school, just volunteering, helping your community, um, learning to talk in front of people, things like that. Even if you're super awkward like me, I know you've been watching me talk for 25 minutes now, so I apologize. Um, I think that looks really good and helps prepare you really well for working with people when you have to leave college and go get a job like this. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. And this one is, at times, did you ever get frustrated with your job? If you did, what did you do to motivate yourself? And it could be your job or even in college as well. Yeah, I have definitely been frustrated and unmotivated and tired, sometimes both in my job and when I was in college um, and when I was in high school. There are a lot of different ways to go to, to get help for that or to help yourself get through that. I think the most important thing is to, to talk to people, to remember that it is okay to not always be able to do everything. It is okay to not have the answer. It is okay to be tired. It is okay to be sad. It is okay to get frustrated. Um, ever since I started working here, something I'm really thankful for is that I have always felt like I can go talk to um, my team leader uh, or to my boss and say, hey, I've been having a hard time emotionally. I'm not sure I can tackle this project. Um, what do I do? Can you can you help me out? Can you help lower some of this on this project so you're not stressed out too much? Um, or you can go to people outside of your work, um, outside of your school. You can. I've spent a lot of time talking to my parents, talking to therapists. Um, you don't you don't have to be strong and pretend like everything is always okay. It is always okay to struggle, and I encourage everyone to go ask for help when you are, because people are there to help you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for volunteering your time to give some words of wisdom to the students and hopefully they'll be more interested to learn more about Edwards and what we do as engineers here or pilots or any of the careers during these next few days. Thanks again, Emily. Of course. And now we'll be going to our NASA activity in a second. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Sure. I'm just trying to get the offending portion down since that's on there as well. All right, Sarah, you are live. When, it, when it's the end of the day, I'll kill it. All righty, let me get this going. Hello, everyone, and thank you for um, joining us at the Aerospace Valley Air Show. Um, we'd like to thank um, Edwards Air Force Base, the 412 uh, Test Wing, for an amazing opportunity to be able to live stream and connect with you. Um, I'm part of the um, NASA EPDC Education Specialist um, uh, team. Uh, EPDC stands for STEM Engagement and Educator Professional Development Collaborative, which means that um, when you get a chance to talk to your teachers um, and your parents, um, be sure and let them know to, to look us up. We have a lot of great resources uh, for you all that they can use in their classrooms. Um, I'm actually at um, Ames Research Center, um, and that's where I am an education specialist. So today we're going to talk about um, the launch of board system or the Artemis program. Um, so um, there's a picture of my friend Monica, who is a specialist at, at um, Armstrong. And um, she actually, who knows if, if when times or when things get better, she'll, you might even see her at your school visiting uh, one time or another. And that's myself at Ames Research Center. So we're actually, there's about 10 NASA centers across the United States. And you may um, know of a couple of famous um, and popular centers out there. Um, uh, can, maybe some of you have watched any of the launches. A lot of the launches happen at Kennedy Space Center. Um, or if many of you out there want to be an astronaut, you maybe have heard of astronauts training at Johnson Space Center, which is, which is in Texas. Um, but um, 
uh, we, uh, Monica and I are actually at ARC and AFRC, the ones that are circled in red, the centers right here in California, in, in this great state. And um, a lot of great uh, things happen at, at Ames and, um, and uh, Armstrong. Uh, it's a lot of great research, and we're going to talk about that, a little bit about that today. So today we're going to explore um, what is Artemis and what, what, what kind of program is that uh, that we have here at NASA. We're also going to talk about the Space Launch System, which is a very integral part of, of the program. Then we have the Launch Abort System, which is also very important. And we have a NASA hands-on activity, which some of you, I'm sure, probably have the materials at your house. And um, they're pretty simple materials to find. If you can't, if you don't have the ones that I that I'm going to display on the screen, I'm sure you can find something to substitute those um, materials. So the launch abort vehicle um, uh, is basically an activity where you're going to find the center of mass, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, in the presentation. Um, but uh, there's something that we call the engineering design process, which is that diagram you see at the bottom of the screen with all the pretty, the, the, the colorful um, uh, colors there at the bottom of your screen, which is ask, imagine, uh, plan, create, test, improve. And you'll notice, um, and since you're in middle school, you may have already seen a diagram similar to this, um, that this is really basically um, a process very much like the scientific um, uh, process where you um, actually can ask questions about what you're trying to um, improve or trying to create. Um, you can imagine um, some ideas that you may have. And, and a lot of times when we go into classrooms and we talk to teachers and, and educators, we talk about how um, this imagination uh, stage is really a part where you can really think out of the box. Even the craziest ideas sometimes become the best ideas. So we really don't um, uh, limit uh, the ideas to something that that sounds that can that that's you know pretty ordinary. Then you make a plan. So you have to draw a diagram and you plan it all out. Then you get to creating um, your plan and following your plan, and then you test it out. Um, and then you start noticing, you start collecting data and start checking it out. Okay, what can I improve? How can I improve this and make this better? Um, and then if you'll notice, it's in a circle because a lot of times you go back to that stage of planning and then creating and testing. And then finally, when you finally get to the point where, okay, I think this is really good, I'm ready to share it, then you can share it with your classmates. But um, that's kind of the process that you can carry when you do this uh, launch abort vehicle um, activity. So there's, um, Next Gen STEM is uh, three major areas that we're looking at um, when we're working here at NASA. One of them is the Artemis program, and we're going to talk about uh, Moon to Mars and what that means. Um, the other is the Commercial Crew program, which we're going to talk about um, more tomorrow. And then, of course, the third one is Small Steps to Giant Leaps, which we talked about uh, yesterday, if you joined us at, at yesterday's um, uh, presentations. If not, I'm sure that they were recorded and you can have access to them at the end of the air show. But, um, and so Small Steps Giant Leaps have, leaps have a lot to do with flight and, and lowering the sonic boom. So we're gonna watch a video um, of the launch aboard uh, vehicle. And um, it's not very long, but hope you, you guys enjoy it. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Launch vehicle is carrying the AAC launch aboard system for a full stress test.
Sure, full side. So there goes the LAS. Tumbling a bit. Orion coming down. Start Everything data looking rebroadcast. good so far. Recall there are no parachutes on this test day, so once the data recorders have been deployed and the vehicle is no longer transmitting data, TC will call test complete. We're looking now at the Orion. That data is being written. We're about to get ejection of those EDRs. Okay, so um, you got to see how important that launch um, test is, and we're going to talk even more about that as we continue on with the presentation. So Artemis, exploring moon to Mars. Now, some of you may remember um, that we've been to the moon before with our Apollo missions, but we're going to talk a little bit more about um, why we call um, this program Artemis and what makes this different than other, um, than other times that we've been to the moon. So it's, it, the Artemis program is going, actually it's going to be, or is, um, divided into three different um, phases. Um, the first phase, you can see how we have the LR, LRO, which is kind of on the right hand side of the diagram. You'll see the little screen there, it looks like um, a satellite and it's kind of, uh, actually it's, it's orbiting around the moon and it's collecting data. Um, LOR stands for Lunar um, Recon Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter. Um, and it's basically collecting data that, um, that is really uh, being sent down to uh, NASA to find the best place to, um, to land. Um, then we have Artemis II, which is the first humans to orbit the moon and rendezvous in deep space in the 21st century. And of course, um, phase three, which will um, actually Orion and, and the crew will dock uh, to human landing system for um, crew expedition to the surface. Um, so first of all, um, talking a little bit more about why we're, um, why the name is um, uh, Artemis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of you or most of you are probably very familiar with the Apollo missions, but we're going to learn in this video um, how Apollo had a twin sister. Fifty years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers, this time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wonder if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. So um, the technology that we're going to be needing to return to the moon um, is uh, really moving rapidly. Uh, in order to send the first woman and the next man to the South Pole of the moon by 2024 um, and establish the uh, exploration with commercial and international partners um, by 2028, um, the technology development and demonstrations um, are going to have to mature and they are maturing um, very quickly in the following capacities. So um, really, we're going to be utilizing the moon's uh, resources 
Um, so that's the only way that we're going to be able to um, be able to do deep uh, space exploration and, and getting to uh, Mars is by utilizing those resources that we will find or that we know are there on the moon and utilizing those. Um, establishing the uh, sustainable power during lunar day and night cycles. Um, building machinery and electronics that work in extreme environments like um, like the super chilly permanently um, sh shadowed uh, craters. As you all may be keeping up with what we know about the moon, um, there are um, uh, ice crystals, uh, mitigating lunar dust, uh, carrying out surface excavation, uh, manufacturing and construction duties, and extreme access with, which includes um, navigating and exploring the surface uh, and subsurface of the moon. So um, there's four main areas that we're, uh, that are going to help us accomplish this. Um, the SLS, um, the Space Launch System, is that super powerful rocket that we have. It's the only rocket with the power and capability required to carry astronauts to deep space. Um, on board the Orion spacecraft. And you can kind of see in this photograph here on the left, that big um, orange, um, uh, that's the SLS, that's like the spine of, of the rocket. And then at the top, you'll see that kind of pointy um, little part there. Um, so that's where um, Orion is like the only spacecraft capable of carrying and sustaining crew on missions to deep space. Uh, providing emergency abort capability, and that's what we've talked about with the with the um, LAS um, and safe reentry from lunar to return velocities. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see the exploration ground systems. Um, that's where the SLS and Orion programs um, uh, are supported at Kennedy Space Center. Um, so you'll see how um, you know there's there's um, it's. It's a it's a nice platform that can can support and 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 the um, the launches and then there's Gateway. So Gateway is is going to be uh, orbiting around the moon. It's where the the home of the astronauts will be, um, and all this will be uh, uh, be able to be possible with the payloads that are going to be delivered with the different Artemis um, uh, phases of of sending. You know, and of course, this is not NASA working alone. They're working across with many different um, companies, commercial companies as well across the United States. So this is not just um, uh, a NASA thing. It's really a, um, a United States uh, a thing. So, um, so one of the things that um, NASA really works on is to protect um, astronauts and protect life. Uh, so the, the dangers that are really surrounding and, and really um, uh, a danger to astronauts is space radiation, as you may already uh, know about. Uh, but really, they're, NASA is studying about um, not only space radiation, but also um, the isolation, the the mental isolation that that, that astronauts go through, um, you know, distance from the Earth, the gravity fields, uh, hostile or closed environments, all of these things are things that are important to remember and to think about when astronauts um, are actually working. Um, so, you know, they're they're studying how these are affecting astronauts and how to protect them and keep, of course, astronauts safe. So a human journey to Mars at first glance like um, offers an inexhaustible amount of complexities. So to bring a mission um, to the red planet from fiction to fact, um, NASA has um, uh, a group of, they, they are called the Human Research Program that has organized hazards and, and it, that astronauts might encounter um, on, a, on a continual basis into like five classifications that you see here on the screen. Um, so all of these are going to be, all of these areas are going to be looked at and, and really um, addressed in depth. And, um, and so hopefully, you know, I think very soon, if, it, if not um, in the next month or so, there'll be a podcast um, with content on, on these different hazards. 
So as I mentioned earlier, um, astronauts have to be kept safe. And in, in order to ensure that astronaut safety, of course, is going to be um, paramount and, and uh, you know, before they even consider uh, traveling to space. So NASA is developing the technologies that, that will enable humans to explore new destinations into the solar system. So America um, will use the Orion spacecraft. Um, of course, we've already talked about the la the space launch system or the SLS rocket, um, and uh, there'll be low um, orbiting uh, into places like you know an asteroid and eventually asteroid and eventually to Mars. Um, but in order to keep astronauts safe in such difficult and yet like exciting missions, um, NASA and Lockheed Martin collaborated to design and build the launch abort system. And this is where we're talking about. Um, many of you, since you're in middle school, are probably even talking about the center of mass or center of gravity. Um, that may be um, things that you're already talking in your science, talking about in your science classes, and it's something that's really interesting because, to me, because um, these are the same basic fundamentals that that engineers use even at NASA um, to to ensure that um, astronauts are safe. So here's another, uh, you know. Great photograph of of the um, launch, a space launch system or SLS, and um, and we'll we'll take a closer look at the SLS because it's the only one of this kind. So it's the only rocket, as I said earlier, with the power and capability required to carry astronauts to deep uh, space aboard the Orion spacecraft. And and I think I have a diagram in the next slide, maybe or two, that has a different. Um, uh, tops right there, you see Orion spacecraft at the point at the top, and then on on the on the, there's an in on your screen, you'll see this little um, inlay like photograph closer of the Orion um, spacecraft, um, and uh, you'll hopefully I think it's in there. Uh, you'll see um, how they're a little bit different than a cargo. So. What helps or what enables um, the SLS to be able to carry, um, to be able to do this, right? To, to complete this feat? Well, um, the foundation for a generation of human exploration missions to deep space is within this uh, SLS. It's got a core stage, which you see here in the center, kind of like we said, mentioned earlier, the spine. You can see there the engines. It has uh, four RS 25 engines, has all of the 730,000 gallons um, combined with um, all the thrust. Here we go. And then there's boosters on the side. There's five segments, solid fuel. Uh, the shuttle derived initially. So combined thrust of 7.2. Um, oh, okay, here's the diagram I was looking for. Great. So if you look at the, um, the uh, across the screen, you'll see how some are pointed and some are rounded. The pointed ones are going to have the cargo or the crew inside, like um, we were talking about earlier. Um, and the ones that are rounded are more for cargo, as you see, as the diagram increases, the weight increases as well. And here's Orion spacecraft. Let's talk a little bit more about Orion very quickly. So this is going to really lead us nicely into the activity that you're going to be doing today. So the launch abort system can be activated in milliseconds. It has three solid propellant motors, and it goes up to travels up to uh, 600 miles per hour. And this is your uh, the crew module. So it carries four crew members beyond uh, the moon. Um, you can see how it's. Um, it's pressurized and it has it's habitable, and then the service module. Oops, go back. Um, there you see the service module in space uh, propulsion. It's got power and thermal control, high altitude ascent aborts, and water and air. Also, let's see if I can. Okay. This next um, video is a quick um, animation of the test ascent abort and um, and. Really, um, we like to play this one because it really shows that part of balancing. So, kind of carry us into the activity here. Thank you. 
Okay, so that was a, a nice uh, close up view of what happens. So um, how can we balance an object and what is a center of gravity? So first we have to talk about what is a center of mass. So if you take your ruler or something like a ruler and you try to find your center of gravity, a ruler is pretty, <clears throat> pretty standard. So it's right in the center is probably a spot that's really good to try to balance the object. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have the sledgehammer with a heavy end, right? One, heavy, one end is heavier. So just by looking at that, um, you know, people um, may think, well, maybe I'll just find the center of gravity right in the center. But in this case with the sledgehammer, we know that that's not the case, right? So every, every object has a center of mass and the exact center of all the material an object is made of. So an object's center of mass is a point at which it can be balanced. So sometimes a center of mass is directly in the center of the object, as we see with the ruler, as I mentioned earlier, and that will be pretty easy to find. Um, and you can even try that out with your finger and just put the ruler on top and see if you can find the exact spot. Um, or, um, but, um, but the center of mass is, or actually the center of mass is also called the center of gravity. So, um, so sometimes it's not the center, as I said, with a different object. So look at the, the sledgehammer. The sledgehammer um, has most of its mass on the far, on the right, on the right end. So its center of mass is going to be much closer to the heavier end of the object. All right, so when you look at flight and comparing that to flight, um, of course, the technical terms are pitch, yaw, and roll. So pitch is that uh, is the nose of the airplane and it slants up or down, and the pilot uses elevators on the vertical stabilizer to control the pitch. Uh, yaw is the nose uh, of the airplane moves side to side on the horizontal axis. So pilots use a rudder on the horizontal stabilizer to control yaw. And of course, roll is the entire airplane tilts to the left or to the right. So pilots use the uh, ailerons to control roll. So that's what it is on an airplane. And then if you look at an airplane center of gravity, uh, the center of gravity is also known as CG. And uh, the effective point whereby like all weight is considered uh, to be. So the CG is also the same point where the axis of flight um, meet. So this point isn't fixed on any aircraft, but it moves forwards or backwards along the longitudinal axis, depending on how the aircraft is loaded. So um, it is vital that its center of gravity remain uh, within the certain limits. Um, uh, however, you know, as an aircraft that is too, like too nose or too tail heavy, will either not fly or be so difficult to control that it becomes too dangerous to try. So um, these limits are referred to as its operational um, envelope. Uh, let's see if we can get to the next slide. Okay, let's get to our activity. Here's our activity. And so you're going to need four paper clips, a popsicle stick, and um, a Chanel stick or a pipe cleaner. And you can follow directions to just um, to design it. And we challenge you to use different weights. Once you figure it out with the paper clips, you can try different weights. Here are some discussion questions. Um, how can geometry be important when designing aircraft? What is balance? What is stability? And what is CG? And how could altering the size or shape of the crew module design will affect the flight path? Thank you. Hope you guys have a great time designing. <laughs>